Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back from your break. Hope you were able to get outside, see a bit of the sunshine if there is sunshine where you are. Um, we are really pleased to have with us uh, Naomi Smith. Um, if you came to our Calking Cambridge event, you would have heard uh, Naomi speak. Uh, she's really fantastic. I'm really pleased that uh, you're here with us today, Naomi. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we're recording, we're ready to go. Uh, please go ahead when you are ready. Well, thank you for the lovely introduction and I hope I live up to expectations. Um, so today I'm discussing something that I did speak about at Calc in person and something I've spoken about before about technology and how I feel critical librarianship isn't addressing technology. The aim of um, my presentation today is to again reiterate why I think the library needs to be critical of technology and AI, um, to examine what it means though to be critical of tech and AI. I am going to be um, talking about how I try to be critical and how I try to resist um, technology and AI, but I will be highlighting the strengths and limitations of my chosen methodology, you may say. Um, you would have seen in the abstracts, I'm reflecting on whether the master's tools can dismantle the master's house. Um, that's a very famous saying by Audre Lorde. And I think this message really is kind of embedded within this presentation. Um, so I'd like you, if you can, to always kind of keep that question in the back of your mind, even when I'm presenting some of my work. And then at the end, I will have um, a summary, reflections and recommendations. I should have put recommendations in inverted commas um, because I don't know necessarily if we can offer recommendations. I think it's all down to what individuals feel they can do and what individuals feel that they want to do. But I will be offering what I, from my perspective, think we can um, all try to do. So the primary goal of my work, and I would say this is the primary goal of all my work, it definitely carries very strong social justice elements. It definitely is very much um, focused on race and resistance. Um, and I've put warning could be triggering because I know in this presentation, I will be talking about um, sexual violence. Um, in my work before, I've talked about, I've used words such as white supremacy, and I know these words can be triggering for both white and non-white people. So um, if you feel uncomfortable, um, like Darren and Michelle have said um, at the beginning, um, please feel free to just come in and come out. I won't take it um, personally. I thought I'd do an introduction to me um, because it really explains why my work um, is so focused on race and resistance. I definitely think positionality is very important um, because it really does influence our work. When I talk to undergraduates, um, I know there's in academia this idea that all research is unbiased, all research is quote unquote neutral, even though the word neutral is actually quite problematic because uh, critical theorists would argue there's no such thing as being neutral. To be neutral is to actually just stick and support the status quo. Um, so I wanted to do a breakdown of certain things, which I know definitely influence my work, definitely influence the tone of my work. And I would argue even influence how my work is even um, received by people. So I would like to start with um, me doing my master's at the University of Leeds um, in a subject called race and resistance. And 
Honestly, I would say if it wasn't for that master's, I would not be speaking here today. Um, so that master's really, really, really just opened my eyes to the inequalities um, within society, of course, but a lot of unlearning for me. Um, I will be very honest, before I did this master's, and this may come as a surprise and shock to people who know me now, but I definitely say I would kind of fall within um, like black conservative views. So, you know, like in America, when you hear um, black conservative politicians who say, well, when it comes to things like Black Lives Matter, um, you know, black people shouldn't be so they shouldn't if they weren't in the wrong in the first place they wouldn't be shot that really was that kind of mentality I had very similar to um, certain home secretaries we've seen and currently see in terms of being very um but having a lot of I would say a lot of anti-blackness and a lot of um a lot of um desire to assimilate within the status quo and that definitely did come about um, because of my family but also because of my education and I'll get into that um, when I start to discuss certain privileges that I have. After though my master's in race and resistance I then went on a few years later to do the library and information studies and that's where my critical librarianship really developed because I saw how a lot of the things that I learned in my race and resistance definitely had a role and a place in the library. Um, so what I would also say as well, um, in terms of that masters in race and resistance, it definitely influences my work in the sense of, this is why I'm very um, big and keen on using theory just because in my race and resistance masters, I was taught critical race theory. I was taught Foucault. I was taught black feminism. I was even taught um, black Marxism, um, which for those who haven't heard of black Marxism, um, I think it would be very interesting to those who are very interested in class. And I know tomorrow there's um, Darren, Andrew and a few others are talking about class. Um, is a theory that I definitely want to move forward to try to incorporate more into my work um, because it basically argues how capitalism created racism. Um, if you look at the Atlantic slave trade, that really kind of really came out of like the Enlightenment period. And a lot of people have argued how before the Atlantic slave trade, Slavery was very much part of um, society um, in African societies, um, non-European societies. But when the Europeans got involved and for kind of similar reasons in the sense of wanting to get cheap labor in order to make a profit, you know, the basic tenets of capitalism, in order though to justify and kind of like make um, the Atlantic slave trade continue, this is when they started to introduce um, and create racialization and race, you know, justifying, you know, we need to use these people for our labor because these people aren't even people, you know? So I think it's definitely a very interesting argument. And yeah, I learned all these things in my masters, which I carry into uh, my library work. Currently, I'm a subject librarian. Um, I'm a subject librarian for global black studies, law, criminology, and policing. And I would say my global black studies, um, being the subject librarian, is I love it. And it's really much keeping me in touch with looking at race and um, keeping up to date with um, things going on within black studies. My positionality, I identify as black, neurotypical, cisgender, heterosexual, heterosexual librarian. Um, I thought I would add that just because um, a librarian named Una, who is here um, as part of um, the attendance, she did a really great presentation at a Mercian. And I remember she put down her positionality and privileges. And I thought, oh, I really, really like that. I'm going to start doing that um, <laughs> when in my presentations. Um, but I think as well, generally, like I said, all, all 
these facts really help you hopefully to understand where I'm coming from and why I um, look at things a certain way. And then finally, my privileges. So I definitely feel like I have something called light skin privilege. So people in Western countries, I find, I don't find this when I go to non-white countries, but in the West, people always assume that I'm mixed race. And when I mean mixed race, that I'm half white and half black, and I'm actually not. Um, my maternal grandmother was um, American and she was a mixture of um, African-American and Native American. And she came out very, very fair um, to the point where um, she actually passed as white. And for those who know um, American history, that was a natural um, phenomenon phenomena, um, in America where light-skinned, black, brown people, if they looked light enough, they would identify and racialize themselves as white to escape racism because my grandmother was living pretty much in the Jim Crow era. So um, I get my color in from her, but I also um, think it does help to explain why before my race and resistance, I had a certain um, mindset because my grandmother in distancing herself from her African-American and Native American roots. Culturally, she also had to. And I definitely think she did pass that on to my mom, who then passed that on to me. Um, on my dad's side, I am, my dad is Jamaican, but again, his mother was also very fair skinned um, because in the Caribbean, in different Caribbean islands, you definitely see this where you get a lot of black people who are light skinned, who have loose hair texture, light, color, light colored eyes, just because of the sexual violence that was committed against enslaved Africans. So they are mixed, but they are not strictly that half white, half black binary, which I think in the UK and in parts of Europe, I think there is this, um, there is this kind of narrow way of looking at race still in comparison to other um, other countries. And I've also put educational class privileges. So this is not something I really like to talk about just because I really, they were, I really hated going to um, those schools, but I was actually um, in private education um, from around age, three because I went to like a private nursery actually up until the age of 18 so I've always been in private education and it was the worst experience um I mean it did give some privileges which privileges such as the fact how um when it came to you know going to a Russell Group University and for those who are not from the UK um Russell Group Universities are basically like the top universities um, after Oxford and Cambridge. Um, when it, in private edu in private schools, definitely the private school I was in from age fourteen, um, definitely kind of gets. I was I was asked the question, do I want to go to Cambridge or Oxford? And if the answer was no, which for me it was, it's like okay, well the next thing will be a Russell Group University. So and being kind of prepared academically for the next two years um, to get into this type of university. So for me, even my ability to kind of access and do these masters, I think definitely comes down to education. My ability to even thrive at these universities came down to education um, because a lot of um, non-white people will say how when they go to Russell Group universities or you know even being in, in the library sector when you're non-white it makes you feel uncomfortable. I didn't really have that problem because I have always been the only black face um, when it comes to education and because I was kind of assimilating into that status quo anyway I didn't really have um, 
you could say a problem until I started my race and resistance and began to unlearn all the anti-blackness that I had internalized. So that's just a little introduction to me about, um, yeah, my work, why I do the work I do basically. And I would like to um, just touch upon this quote before I start to touch into why we need to be critical, because you would have seen on the Calc, um, the Calc website, all the different programs. And it's amazing that there's, you know, things specifically looking at um, being neuroatypical, things looking specifically at um, class. Um, and I do agree with this quote that everything does come from the same source. Um, I personally believe everything comes from capitalism. But in my abstract, you would have seen that I question the, 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 the statement whether the master's tools can dismantle the master's house, which was also by Audre Lorde. And I also think this quote is, can be questioned, can be open to, you know, reflection in the sense of, I remember when I was at UCL and we had, um, we had like an EDI, um, we had like an EDI um, lesson one day. And I remember the person coming in and discussing racism and then a tutor actually saying, I feel the same because I'm from a working class background and people always make fun of my accent when I was, you know, progressing through academia. And the EDR officer was like, it's not really the same because if you want to, even though you shouldn't have to, you can mask your um you can mask your accent whereas i can't change my skin color and the tutor really couldn't see where he was coming from and i think was actually um getting offended but i know for myself um you know when i was at when i was in primary school the benefits of um, private education you can say i actually had elocution lessons and I did speech and drama and our teacher always used to say you know outside your exams because we had to we had exams in this you can you can speak however you want to but when you're in this classroom you need to speak quote-unquote Queen's English which is perfect pronunci pronunciation um things that I have actually lost because I still really stumble on certain words um but yeah just going back to this conference, I definitely think we need to have an intersectional perspective when it comes to oppression, but I honestly and strongly believe that race always, always needs to be mentioned. Because I definitely agree with Sophia Noble, who says, when Black people get free, everybody gets free. And just going back to what I was saying in terms of, can you mask certain things? even for things that you can't mask, uh, let's say a person in a wheelchair, you have to ask yourself if it was a white person in a wheelchair in comparison to a black person in a wheelchair, would the experiences be different? And the evidence suggests that yes, like it would be different. But me saying that I don't want people to think that I'm trying to pit uh, groups against each other because I really like the end of this quote where it says, you know, we remain in active solidarity with all oppressed people who are fighting for their liberation. And we know that our des destinies are intertwined. So bearing into mind, um, for me, like I said, why race always needs to be mentioned. This goes to the question of what does being critical of tech mean? So I don't know about you, but I know in my institution where I work, we definitely have been getting a lot of um, emails and a lot of things about AI, generative AI, um, chat GBT, uh, chat, was it GBT, GBT, GPT? Um, you know what I'm talking about, but yeah, we have been getting a lot of emails and I definitely think some of the some of the things we are we are receiving fall into 
a version of critical where we're only looking at these things from positions of academic integrity and what does it mean about you know for students that ethics in terms of plagiarism and you know like how what does it mean for their work and how do we get how do we get students to think of of these things in a critical way in the sense of they don't automatically think the these this technology is good but like I said for me oh why is it not moving oh, okay for me critical it always relates to the social justice elements. Personally, when I think critical, I always think of critical race theory. That's what the critical for me stands for. Um, so I really again just like some of these things that I've seen on Twitter. And I really like what um, Kim Gallen said about how black studies should be at the center of academic and non-academic discussions about the significance and future of AI, because it asks, what does it mean to be human? And I think that's what we need to be asking when it comes to these technologies. Um, who is it favoring? So with chat um, GPT, like it's regurgitating information, but that would mean a lot of the information it's regurgitating is going to be biased against certain types of humans. When it comes to technology, again, it, there's always going to be somebody who is um, not benefiting in comparison to other groups. And I have kind of spoken about these kind of racial issues embedded within technology within um, my webinar um, that I uh, did back in March. And um, if you were present or if you go back to uh, listen to it, it's available on UCL Information Studies. I say at the beginning how when it comes to critical librarianship, I don't really know why people are ignoring it because there are so many resources out there that are talking about this issue, such as Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble. But I would actually like to apologize for that statement because I feel it was coming from an assumption that everybody has time to read. And this is something that um, Andrew Prita and Simon Barron talk about in um, an article, an open access article they made about um, systems librarians. And I'll actually read um, what they say. Um, they say, with technological developments to be aware of, aware of, operational support to deliver and new developments to implement, system workers have little time or energy to digest and discuss theory relevant to their practice and less still to critically reflect on how to apply theory to practice. So I thought that I would include this short video and I would actually like to play it. It's a three minute video because there may still be some of us present who don't exactly know what it means when we talk about algorithms or, you know, have wanted to read Sophia's noble work. It's on their to read list, but just haven't had the time to read it. So I would just like to leave this presentation for a moment and just um, go, go and play this video. Um, oops, so I, oh, that was the, that was the um, article I was talking about, by the way, but yeah, hopefully you can still see my screen and hopefully you can hear the audio. We can't see your screen or hear the I'm... audio. Oh, okay. Um, let me see if I can rectify that. Um, Right. Can you see it now? Yeah, that's good. Okay, and hopefully you can hear it. Hi, my name is Safia Umo. Could you hear that? Yeah, we can, yeah. Okay, perfect. Noble, and I'm an assistant professor in the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism. My research looks at racist and sexist algorithmic bias and the way in which people are marginalized and oppressed by digital media platforms. 
I spent 15 years in corporate marketing and advertising, working for some of the largest Fortune 100 brands in the United States. We were starting to redirect significant portions of our advertising media buying dollars online and thinking about, in fact, how to game Google Search and Yahoo to elevate the brands and amplify the messages. And so at the moment that I was leaving corporate America and moving into academia, the public was increasingly falling in love with Google. And this led me to thinking that this was a space and a place that needed to be looked at more closely. It was interesting to see this total diversion of public goods, um, public knowledge in libraries being shifted into a corporate, privately held company. When we go to places like Google Search, the public generally thinks that what they'll find there will be credible and fairly representing different kinds of ideas, people, and spheres of knowledge. And so this is what really prompted a six-year inquiry into this phenomenon of thinking about misrepresentation on the internet, particularly when people are using search engines. And that culminated in my new book, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. People think of algorithms as simply a mathematical formulation. But in fact, algorithms are really about automated decisions. In 2009, I was kind of joking around, in fact, with a colleague, and I was telling him that I was really interested in what's happening with Google. And just kind of offhand, he said to me, oh yeah, you should see what happens when you Google black girls. Of course, I immediately did the search down that pornography was the primary way that black girls, Latina girls, Asian girls were represented. That started a whole deeper line of inquiry about the way in which misrepresentation happens for women of color on the internet and what some of the broader social consequences of that are. But in my work, I look at the way that these platforms are designed to amplify certain voices and silence other voices how does that come about? What is that phenomenon about? What's the role of capital or advertising dollars in driving certain results to the first page? What do the results mean in kind of a broader social, historical, economic context? So I contextualize the results that I find to show how incredibly problematic this is because it further marginalizes people who are already living in the margin, people who are already suffering from systemic oppression. And yet again, these results show up in these platforms as if they are credible, fair, objective, neutral ideas. In the end, I call for alternatives. And I argue um, strongly that we need to have uh, things like public interest search that are not driven by commercial biases. And I put out some ideas about um, what it means to imagine and create alternatives in our public information sphere that are based on a different set of ethics. If anything, I think that this book is the kind of book that will help us reframe the idea that we should just Google it and everything will be fine. Okay, so let me try and... Um get back into um, sharing my PowerPoint. Okay. So hopefully everyone is kind of on, um, everyone can still hear me. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah, and um, we can see your slides. Okay, perfect. Um, so hopefully everyone is kind of um, on this now a similar understanding of what is an algorithm. And just to highlight that this algorithm that Sophia was talking about, this is pretty much the same algorithm that is in library discovery systems, that is in chat GBT, um, that is in social media. Um, it's literally... Um, we we can even in a way call life as an algorithm in the sense of we do things to get a result um and that's why i have these pictures of um you know doing things to get a result so i think that's kind of like the easiest way to think of an algorithm but why there needs to be a critical um an analysis of algorithms especially when there is all this evidence that 
algorithms are extremely biased. Um, I've put in when I was at Calc online, I said that, you know, why critical librarianship needs to discuss this and the fact that it's missing. So it's missing in conventional um, critical librarianship books where they talk about library collections, me metadata management, library spaces, everything except technology. And this is the same in America, whereas it, as in this book also does not mention technology, it mentions everything else though. So there really is a really big gap that is in critical librarianship. But for me, I'm and Germany with my work, I try not to just focus on the problem. I really try to focus on the solution. Um, Ad, uh, Adler was somebody who said that um, work um, should move beyond critiquing issues into actionable recommendations. And I really think that is the case, that should be the case, especially for things to do with like race and other social justice issues. We know there's a problem and we keep saying there's a problem, but we need to find a solution. And rather than wait for people to give us a solution, I think we need to come together and try to create solutions so for me, um, why I had this underlying message about whether the master's tools can um, dismantle the master's house. So applying to technology, can we collectively or as individuals come together to talk about these issues, to, to bring awareness and also to find solutions? And I, on one hand, definitely think that technology especially social media um does have an does ha have a great role to play um this is somebody called um angel jones dr angel jones and she like put this up in a tweet and it just really resonated with me in the sense she has a very social justice focused um instagram account that receives so many um views in comparison to the quote unquote more traditional methods. Um, so again, thinking about us as a library um, community, you know, I would say there are ways to bring about certain critical librarianship issues such as technology or issues that you personally are interested in um, to a wider audience. Because for me as well, I also think for real social justice, to happen, it can't just be within even just conferences like this in the sense of just academics or librarians being aware of these issues. I think it definitely needs a wider participation. So for me, I'm also very much especially interested in TikTok. And if you were at Lilac, there was um, discussions about TikTok, how students are gravitating towards TikTok for their educational resources. But um, TikTok is actually becoming its own kind of academic um, field in its own right. And I don't know if you can see these quotes because um, they are there's quite small, but, you know, there's a TikTok and social movement special issue um, in, a, in a journal that came out. And here they were really just talking about how TikTok especially can really... Um, galvanize and spread a lot of social justice um a lot of social justice um ideals um so i don't know i can't actually really see this hopefully um in the recording you can like zoom in but it's just basically these different academics these different activists all just talking about how tiktok is a really great tool and medium and I'll be honest i also have used tiktok to spread critical librarianship messages and like I was saying, TikTok has become really, especially TikTok for social justice, has become a really big thing. And so this is an open access um, report um, that was done. It was a public scholarship project. And I would encourage people to read it because it is actually really, really interesting. However, there are some very, very key pitfalls in um, TikTok and I would say social media in general. Um, so in Digital Femininities, and I actually have a copy of that book with me because it is actually a really good book. Um, she 
Frankie, Frankie Logan basically discusses how Instagram especially, but this can also be applied to social media. When it comes to women, it definitely is a site where you feel judged. Um, I think everybody can feel judged on social media, but especially for women, it's, it's definitely a site that is has a lot of policing, has a lot of surveillance. There's a lot of judgment encroached in something called respectability politics. And I do discuss this in the next slide in a bit more depth. Um, but respectability politics in the sense of what does it mean to be respectful? Um, a lot of women are judged on social media if they have a lot of makeup or if they wear revealing clothes, which ironically are traits that are associated with working class femininity and queer femininity. Um, so respectability politics is definitely within uh, white, cisgender, heterosexual um, idea of what does it mean to be um, respectable. And I would say definitely I feel that in the sense of I know and I think and these books also say that you do get more likes if you look a certain type of way so if your whole uh, message and mission is to try and spread awareness and to try and almost make the algorithm work favorably for you I would say you do have to adopt some of these um quote unquote queer femininity or working class femininity traits However, of course, that then brings on the, the judgment that you can um, get from others. And I would say for women of color, there definitely is um, more judgment that can come because women of color historically have been over-sexualized. I don't know if people here have heard about um, a woman called Sarah Bartman, who was derog derogatorily called um, the hot and tot Venus. Um, she was a woman from South Africa who was brought to Europe because she had a very, very curvaceous body. She had, I think, um, a condition which basically made um, her bottom really like protrude. But she was basically brought to Europe and basically put in like human zoos. Like people would come and like touch her body, and she's really see and created to be this symbol of. Um, primitive sexuality um that it was the beginning of you could say when uh black women especially became um fetishized where you get these ideas of um yeah a ross like these these very kind of um just problematic um problematic constructions of what it means to be a black woman and you, I personally know I see this on um, TikTok, but it also creates the question of whether certain things that I do, whether they're seen as um, over, whether they're over sexualized because I'm a black woman doing it. And this is also actually has been seen in the library sector. So Siobhan, who presented before me, she has a really great article um, that was published by UKSG, where um, in her in her um in her blog her article she talked about how in the library she was having a conversation and comments were made to her of a sexual nature linked to her mixed ethnic heritage because it goes back to this eroticization this um black women being seen as exotic and if you've even read um the famous book by edward said orientalism this is not just for this is not just this eroticization is not just on black women of African descent, it's on other non-white women um, when they're seen through the Western male gaze. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight how these issues can affect our ability, especially as a black woman to resist technology if we want to kind of spread these social justice issues, but they also do can come into the actual work environment of a library. And then just thinking more about kind of identity. And again, these are all quotes that I took from um, Siobhan's um, 
article slash blog and the um i've got the hyperlink at the top because i'd really recommend you reading it navigating whiteness and reflecting on identity vocational or an, an allyship um she talks about how the status quo which favors the white profession professionalism we are required to adopt to succeed as professionals and which grants us potential access to power um she discusses the white female sector um white femininity enforces both respectability politics and an unattainable pressure to be perfect especially in the public eye and i would like to play a short video on tiktok that talks about michelle obama because michelle obama really is i think if we really want to understand respectability politics um when it's applied to black women looking at her when she was in the um the white house and then looking at her when she was when she's now outside the white house you can really see um how respectability politics really um limited her and i just also want to play this tiktok video just because i think it does demonstrate why tiktok is really seen as a great educational resource because this video was made by somebody who did a degree i think a dissertation was in um representation and you will find a lot of um creators on tiktok making very very factual very very um informative um videos that should not be classed as misinformation so i just want to again exit the powerpoint and just um try and play this video Okay, let me just open Google Chrome. Okay, it's not letting me share. Um, let me, if I can't play it, it's not a problem because um, this is being recorded. Let me just try one more time. Okay, it's not letting me play it, but I hope in your own time uh, you can um, click that video because it basically, um, to summarize what she talks about, um, Hold on, let me just get back into sharing. Um... So what, what this video, um... oh, hold on. Am I... Sorry, I kind of don't know what is happening. I can't seem to get control of, oh, perfect, okay, right couldn't get control of my presentation then. But yeah, what the video was basically just discussing about how Michelle Obama, certain things she did, um, there was a there was a time where it was captured of her and Barack um, fist pumping. And an American magazine basically ran a story of how that was a terrorist gesture. And even the way they depicted um, Michelle Obama, they made her have a really massive Afro, even though during office she had very straight hair and later on in interviews she said you know she had to have straight hair because she because of respectability politics um you know her having her natural hair or having braids which I last saw her in is not seen as professional from the um, the white middle class gaze which definitely definitely forms um respectability politics so yeah taking that into account um versus the the idea of the librarian. Um, I just wanted to raise a, draw awareness of the limitations that can come. And then just generally speaking, um, the internet is still not a place of equity or equality. So even when we think about influencers, um, and a lot of the time they do get quite negative, um, kind of negative associations, but black influences 
are actually makes it significantly less money um, than white influences. Um, there was a show by Channel 4 where it was looking at Love Island. Um, it's basically, for those who don't know Love Island, it's a reality TV show where people people go and find love, quote unquote. <laughs> but a lot of people are, are saying that people go on Love Island because they know when millions of people watch Love Island every night and when they exit the Love Island villa they get a lot of, lot of endorsements um, they become a micro celebrity online you can say which is basically what an influencer is but that show showed how black influencers definitely make less money than white influencers and just in general, Black creators have reported experiencing racist jokes, microaggressions and tokenism um, from other people navigating um, the internet space. Um, I know personally, so some of my videos, I have um, experienced some um, racist things said to me. But I also know, kind of going back to what I said at the beginning about um, light skin privilege, how that makes me um more acceptable to a white audience at times and um i i forgot to mention this um, i was going to give a few examples at the beginning of my presentation of how when i was around 12 um this is when i first kind of discovered light skin privilege i was um, brought up in nottingham which is a very diverse city but around nottingham in nottinghamshire um there's a lot of kind of small towns, small mining towns, which are very, very racist. And I was on the bus one day and um, I'd given up my seat to this elderly white man um, who thanked me and was like, oh, this is why, quote unquote, I like half caste people like you because you're not as bad as other. Um, and then he basically said a very derogatory word. And that's when I kind of experienced, wow, so I still am um, disliked, but I'm seen as more, I get more acceptance because people assume that I'm half white. Um, and I, and colorism can also play into acceptance into um, your own community, the black community or Asian communities. I think the World Health Organization um, says that around 77% of women in Nigeria um, use skin whitening or some type of skin bleaching. And those figures are very, very similar to in Asia, South Asia, East Asia. Um, you see colorism really in the entertainment industry in general. Like in the chat before Calc started, there were mentions about Beyonce. But it's very interesting how people like Beyonce and Rihanna, they are definitely talented, but their lightness definitely helps them and you see this in other contexts in the Bollywood industry the Indian cinemas the actors and actresses are all very fair-skinned um k-pop drama which is Korean film again all very fair-skinned and even though if um one of my professors who taught on my race and resistance um, masters, um, Professor Shirley Tate, if she was here, she would say that we shouldn't always automatically assume that when women bleach their skin lighter, it's because they desire to be white, because that really takes away from female agency and just a desire to, you know, change their appearance and can be very seen in very similar terms to when white women or white men um, go on some beds and make their, um, you know, get a darker skin color. So I think that is a very good argument um, because I know it can, sometimes I wonder, do we perpetuate inequality if we keep saying, oh, you know, black people, Asian people, whoever, they want to be white. Um, they, they, it, does it not perpetuate the sense that we all are still carrying this internal anti-blackness? Um, but I think that argument, though, is still kind of um, the argument that we should see potentially skin lightening in the same bracket as sun uh, sunbeds and sun tanning. I think, though, it still, again, raises um, respectability and acceptance and how my work is received as a librarian and how it's received on social media, because the arguments made about um, women 
um, if I just focus on women for now, women with a suntan, skin color is definitely linked to um, economic status. It's linked to the idea, oh, you've been, you have the money to go on holiday. And that's also very much the case um, with colorism. There is definitely a class dimension um, in Africa, Caribbean, Asia, you're here if you're dark, it's because it shows that you work in the manual labor jobs, you're outside in the sun, whereas if you're inside, you know, clearly it's a better job, it's an office job, or even during Atlantic enslavement, um, if you were worked in the house versus working in the plantations, it definitely was seen as better. So there is that class dimension in colorism, but again, I think it supports my argument that Within librarianship, which as we know is a very middle class field, it does give me and afford me privileges. Um, so yeah, if we just go back though to uh, on the platform of TikTok, uh, it is actually a lot of anti-blackness. I know for a while, critical race theory as a hashtag was actually, um, I wouldn't say banned, but video if you hashtag your videos of critical race theory they just wouldn't show um and um uh, 59% of black influence report that actually posting about race negatively impacted them financially so I don't have that problem because I'm not trying to be an influencer I'm trying to um just create awareness and create like an educational platform but I do think these things need to be taken into account again like why we need to critically and acknowledge technology because it really is just a very very racist site um and I put this picture um I saw this picture literally two days ago um I live in East London and I was just on the underground and it said whack lives matter and I don't know why I was shocked because I don't know I've, I'm kind of used to this but for some reason this really just like the inversion of Black Lives Matter in this way just really kind of shocked me. But again, it just makes kind of, I thought it was, it would be useful to put in this presentation to show like, you know, when you are on the internet, there are some people out here who have such anti, well, have such racist views and are so against any type of critical work, which you then are opening yourself up to. And then finally, because we are coming towards the end of my presentation and I've been keeping an eye on the time, um, TikTok, like the internet, just generally, it, it, a lot of misinformation is on that site. Um, this is actually why Dr. Tierra Tanksley, um, she's uh, an American academic, she actually I'm going to just quickly check her Twitter bio because I want to do her justice in um, explaining her. Um, she talks about critical race theory in technology, um, not from a librarian pers perspective, but from um, an education perspective. And she actually talks about how, and I'm just going to direct quote her pinned tweet, when images of black people being killed by police garner over 2.4 million clicks in 24 hours and the average cost per click for related content reaches $6 per click, the virality of black death is not only incentivized but also guaranteed. And this really comes into videos that are the most controversial um, become viral. So you can understand why from a misinformation perspective, why that is a problem, but also thinking about race, why that is a problem. You know, a lot of the time we think when we share certain videos, it's we're, ring, we're raising awareness, but we also, if it's a YouTube video, we're paying YouTube. And I think that again, it highlights the question, can the master's tools really dismantle the master's house? Because yes, you, like I said, you're bringing awareness to these atrocities, but you're also paying YouTube, who I think it we can say does definitely have a lot of algorithm, algorithmically at least, we can say it's anti-Black. So these are just some actual issues, um, issues that are also, I would say, kind of underlie like a philosophical issue and reflection that we also just need to keep in the back of our minds. So, as I said, 
you know, this question, can we use technology to resist technology, the anti-blackness in technology to, or to bring other um, social justice awareness issues? Um, I don't really have an answer, but it would, I guess it'd be interesting to see your thoughts and reflections in the chat or um, on Twitter if you're using the hashtag calc23. So finally, um, this is like my summary. Um, so I do think that there are, um, for, the, for the library um, community, I think regardless of what stage we're at in terms of our understanding of um, critical aspects of technology and AI, we can definitely educate our patrons and colleagues, even if it's just to say that, you know, there's people talking about how racism is embedded within technology. And even though I don't fully understand it, maybe it's worth us um, looking into. I definitely agree that um, any kind of solution, it needs to be intersectional. Um, like I was saying, in towards the, at the beginning of my presentation, um, queer, queerness, um, neuroatypicalness, all these, all these things that create oppression, they definitely all belong together. And if we critically address technology, we do need to be take, we do need to be having intersectional conversations. Um, this is what I also meant when I said um, to be neutral. It's actually not doesn't really exist. You're li like because we are not living in a neutral society, to therefore be neutral is just to be reflecting the society we are in. Um, I've spoken a lot about colorism and my own privileges, just because what I want us all to kind of realize is, we, we, need, we need to be vocal, but sometimes it's harder for others to be vocal and other times it's easier for us to be vocal because we all have these different forms of um, privileges. Um, and I think we just need to support individuals who are trying to make a difference. So I think it's cut off who said this, it was actually by David Hudson, but he said libraries cannot effectively challenge racial domination within the field without being part of larger conversations and movements addressing such systems in other contexts. And I definitely have always believed that's the case, which is why I went on TikTok because with TikTok, um, you know, you can reach a number of people and it's also why um, I've created um, a natural separate educational uh, platform called Black and Gold Education. I did that A because it mitigates all everything I was talking about kind of like the self-judgment um, because on my original uh, TikTok it was like me but it was also like other like lifestyle things and just showing like me outside librarianship whereas this is just going to strictly be talking about um, critical issues um, but again I, I have chosen to do this on TikTok and Instagram specifically because I really want to uh, talk to non-academics I want to talk to young people people outside education um, because I really think for social justice to have the impacts that it needs, everybody needs to be on board and everyone needs to be on similar waves of understanding. And I also included um, Tony Zanders just because um, this was in a Twitter conversation I was having where we were talking about technology. And then I was saying how, oh, it would be nice if the library could build their own technology, could build its own internet almost. Um, but I found this guy through LinkedIn and then I found his Instagram who's actually involved in building actual library software um so I just thought that was really cool basically and hopefully um would his software would try to kind of um not have the issues that you know corporate software does so I would really say if you see people um try to support them that is all I have um I don't know if if I had a concluding did I have a little yeah I did have a thank you page I was let me see I pressed next but it didn't show up let me try and um oh I have one more page sorry I'm lying um finally this is the penultimate page though 
Um, finally, I just think for the library sector, there's just so much scope um, for us to be leaders in um, collective liber liberation. I got this from an Instagram account called Slow Factory, where it was talking about the different roles, the different jobs they could envision um, people playing in order to create a actual decolonial society. And I think librarians should definitely be on there. Um, and to finish it up, because I see I have one minute left, we definitely can and should have a role in collective liber liberation. We have the trust from people. We are respected as a profession. Um, we are respected by individuals. I would say we have a moral obligation to, if you look at the role of libraries in actual col colonization and how they had an active role in making people not want to believe in indigenous forms of knowledge and to believe in Western and the actual role in teaching people to basically hate themselves. I would say we all have, as librarians in this profession, we need to correct the wrongs of the past. Um, and I think we definitely finally have the ability to, we're in a building full of books and resources. And if we're in an academic institution, we also are in a room full of very talented people. So I would like to end there. And thank you for listening. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Naomi. That was perfectly timed as well as you're <laughs> right at noon now. And I didn't have to interrupt you. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, because I would have hated to do that. Um, so yeah, lots of um, stuff in the chat and I've seen a few bits on Twitter, lots of people agreeing with you, sharing resources, et cetera, which is fantastic. Um, I didn't see any questions, but we don't have time for questions, but um, Naomi is on Twitter and will you be around for the rest of the conference as well? Yes, yeah. I will be, yes. Fantastic, so if you want to keep chatting, that's great. Um, so yeah, lots of people saying thank you in the chat as well. Um, thank you. Um, so we will be back at 1pm with Dr. Gurnam Singh, who is our keynote for uh, the conference. Uh, so please do go and enjoy your lunch break. Um, and yeah, we will see you back here at 1pm. And thank you again to Naomi. Thank you.